This beautiful futuristic camera is the Lytro Illume, and it's unlike any camera you've used before because it can do this. The light field resolution of this camera is 40 mega rays. Unlike a traditional sensor, it not only measures how much light is hitting the sensor, but which direction the light is coming from. And that's why I can focus on different planes in the picture even after you've already taken your shot. What I like about the Illume is that it gives the artist and the viewer a different experience when looking at a photo. Not only do you get to frame your picture and have people think about the composition and your subject, but you get to let them travel through each focal plane, experiencing an entire environment in a new way. I have to say that using the Illume was a magnitude harder than regular photography because you have to plan your shot perfectly. You need something in your foreground to focus on, you need a middle ground to focus on, and then something in the background as well. And if you want your picture to be stunning, there has to be a story as you're transitioning through those layers. Tony and I planned a jungle scene where we would have leaves in the foreground to focus on, and then we could draw our viewers through to our model's eyes and have a nice jungle background with fog and some more mood setting features. One thing that we also noticed is that you have to get your picture right in camera because the post-processing isn't as easy as it would be with your DSLR. So you have to make sure that everything is perfect. If you want to try a new Lytro, it's going to cost you about 1500 US dollars, but you could get a used one for about $1,100 online if you want. I wouldn't recommend this camera for a first time shooter or even someone just looking for one camera to shoot with, but if you have the extra money, you have a lot of creative vision and you want to create something truly new and on the cutting edge of photography technology, I would really recommend getting the Lytro. It's fun, you get to experiment, and it's unlike anything anyone has ever seen before. Now I'll hand the camera off to Tony and he can review the specs. The Illume has a nice touchscreen and by default will give you a visual gauge of the distance. Anything blue is in front of the focal plane, anything orange is behind the focal plane, but anything that's highlighted in blue or orange, you'll be able to capture. So typically you'll try to get the most important part of the subject in focus and then take the picture. Now, it really comes alive when you push the Lytro button and turn on the Lytro mode. Now it's showing you a readout of the depth in real time. So Chelsea, hold that ornament out. So now we have some depth in the picture and what I'm going to try to do is not focus on anything in particular, but use the manual focus just to get every part of the foreground and background inside that range. So the ball here is in blue, meaning it's in front of the focal plane and the tree is in orange. So now I can capture the picture. Now these are super boring shots. With the Lytro you really need to plan a shot out, be deliberate about it, and try to get it as perfect as you can because it's not that easy to edit. The touchscreen works better than on any camera I've used. You can swipe out and kind of use it like you would a smartphone. You can see it has a shutter and manual mode as well as program mode. It also has an ISO priority mode which I wish other cameras had. There's no aperture priority mode because the aperture is always fixed. Even for four megapixels, this camera's not sharp. It is a 30 to 250 millimeter f 6.3 equivalent lens, but that's plenty to get some decent background blur out of it. But the autofocus is appalling, no image stabilization, and it crashes every couple of minutes. You really need to plan your shots with this camera, but the results are really rewarding. If you think you're gonna share your pictures on Facebook or Twitter or 500 pics, it's not that easy. Yes, you could render them as a still, but it'll be blurry. You could render them as a video, it won't be especially sharp, and you kind of lose it because we're so used to seeing pulling focus and perspective shifting in video that it doesn't quite have the impact. Really, the only place to share them is on the Lytro website. That's where you get the most impact. People need to interact with your pictures, and that can be kind of hard because I found that putting thumbnails up on Facebook or Twitter of a still image, people interact with it because they see the thumbnail, but they won't necessarily see a thumbnail when you share a link to the Lytro website. And that very simple little thing can kind of be a deal breaker. Nobody sees your pictures, then what good are they, right? Let's go downstairs and process and share some of these Lytro photos. Now let's take a look at the Lytro desktop software. It works an awful lot like Lightroom. You import your pictures in, in fact, it'll pop up automatically when you insert your memory card into the computer and copy them over. Note that the files are either 50 megabytes or 100 megabytes each, each picture when you're shooting the raw file. So 
They're very large, they take a long time to process, but that's all right. You just grab yourself a cup of coffee and they'll be done when you get back. So looking, you can see I can click and it will refocus on different parts of the image. That works pretty well. Uh, once you click the adjust icon here, it switches to something very familiar to Lightroom users. And as you can see, we can adjust the histogram. You can't drag it like you can in Lightroom, but you, you do have sliders down here. So we might just make that just a hair brighter. And I'd love to see some more detail in her hair. So I'm going to raise the shadows up some. There we go. Now, if you're watching this in 1080p, you might think, why are her eyes soft? Did I miss focus? Well, it's kind of impossible to miss focus, right? Because I could focus in front of her and behind her. Everything is captured. But in fact, her eyes are a little soft and it's just the camera. That's just the way it looks. Let's go through some of the other features here. White balance. Um, Tint, all pretty common stuff, saturation, most of the features that you're used to. You notice there's no healing brush. If you want to heal, remove a blemish, clone something out, you'll need to bring it into Photoshop, and that's a bit of an ordeal that I'll show you in just a second. You can adjust the aperture, which is one of the coolest things. Lightroom doesn't have this. Watch this. I'll go from F2 to F16. Now the foreground's in focus, the background is nice and in focus. You can even go down lower to F1. Now the lens itself is physically F2. So F1 means that the desktop app is looking at the depth map and adding additional blur to parts of the picture that are not in focus. We'll bring that back up to F2 and I'll scroll down. Another interesting feature is the focus spread. And what the focus spread will do is give you deeper depth of field than you would have naturally had. So this is really cool. You can adjust the depth of field so that both of a person's eyes are in focus when their head is tilted like this, but the background is still just as blurry. Very, very cool to be able to adjust it virtually like this. And what we'll need to do is to just drag these around to kind of determine the foreground and the background areas that are going to be in focus. Okay, so here we go. Just for the sake of this comparison, I'll leave those foreground leaves in focus and let everything else fall out of focus. And let's go ahead and drop this down to F1 so you can see that background blur a little bit better. So now you can see I just extended the depth of field without impacting the depth of field behind the subject. Very cool to kind of defy the laws of physics using the depth mapping feature. Now let's switch over to another photo. This one didn't go quite as well because it was a little more complex. This is just one of our test shots of Chelsea when we were preparing it before Asia came in. And you can see this is too dark, which it's okay. We can fix that and it did okay. I'm going to drop the blacks down and get some more contrast in here. Okay, so with those couple of adjustments, um, let's poke around the picture and change focus. And you might not notice it right away. Most people did not notice the flaws in this picture, but they are pretty significant. I'm just clicking in the foreground and the background. Now I want you to watch this spot right here. You can see it should be parts of the leaf that are sharp, but instead it's weird and blurry and kind of chunky. And as I click in the background, you can see it now comes into focus. This is a depth mapping problem. The Lytro camera tries to make a map of the depth of the entire picture. And the Lytro desktop then looks at that map and associates it to different parts of the picture and it got part of it wrong. It just guessed that this part was in the background when it was actually in the foreground. We found this in just about 100% of the pictures that we took. The more complexity, the more depth that was in the picture, the bigger the problem the depth map became. You can manually fix this and if you want high quality pictures, you pretty much have to go in and fix this. So from the file menu, I'm going to select export and then editable depth map. Now we can see Lytro has created two files here, a PNG file with the actual depth map and then a TIFF file showing the image itself. We're going to bring both of these into Photoshop. I pasted them as separate layers and lowered the opacity of the top layer so that I can see the depth map and the image hiding behind it. That way I can try to use the original image as a guide for what I need to do. Ah, so I see I need to patch this area up here and you can see there's just a lot of ugliness here. The depth map just didn't work out well at all on this image. Look at these leaves here. So I'm just going to narrow it down to this one spot, but I'm going to try to copy parts of this that seem to have worked better. 
and just clone it right over it. So that was pretty sloppy at that point. Uh, all of that is going to be foreground information. You know, I'm going to go ahead and use the brush tool and a dropper. So with the brush tool, I'm just going to paint that that color in that section correlates to the background. So I'm going to paint over this. Let's go ahead and paint over a couple little splotches here. Okay, so now we'll save that and get it back into the application. So now you can see this section does indeed look a little more natural. Uh, and I think with some time, I could properly paint in the depth field to perfectly match up with those leaves. But that would take some time. And in fact, every picture that you want to publish and have it look nice would require that same level of editing. And so it's all going to take a, a certain amount of time. I showed you those TIFFs. You could also go in and edit the TIFF file to remove blemishes or something else from the model. So everything can be edited. It's a very deliberate and kind of long workflow. As I grab it, I can just drag the mouse from left to right, and you can see it's kind of rendering it in a 3D way, as if the camera had slightly different perspectives. The camera does not actually have slightly different perspectives. What it's actually doing is the Lightro desktop app is mapping it to depth, saying that some things are behind it, and then kind of splitting the picture into different planes and shifting them around. At the edges, it's using something like content-aware fill. It's kind of making up the information behind the subject's head. It's not really there. It doesn't really have that perspective. And in fact, you do see those artifacts as you begin to shift it around a little bit. For example, look at this picture of Justin. And watch the cable right here as I shift from left to right. You can see it just kind of doesn't do a great job of pretending that it's three-dimensional, because it's really not. So we get like a weird break in the cable there. The effect is still pretty convincing. Let's now talk about sharing this picture on the web. From the pictures menu here, I'll click share. And you can see it gives you a couple of options here. You can share it on Facebook if you want, and I'll show you how that works. You can see it gives you two options, either a picture link or a video. If you choose the picture link, it will send the users back to the Lytro site. It just gives them a link with no real thumbnail. At least that's the way Facebook has been displaying it when I tried it. You can also share it as a video, in which case the Lytro website will render it as kind of a moving video and share that video. The Lytro website is really the only place where users can interact with the pictures, and that's where the pictures come alive. I wouldn't bother sharing it in any other way. Let's jump over to the Lytro website. Uh, gives me a link right here. Here's the picture online, and you can see here the quality has degraded even further. We see just like weird kind of chunkiness and noise here. It interacts pretty slowly, um, especially on the website. It becomes really pretty distracting, the, the various quality issues. And a lot of these could be improved further by spending more time in the depth map. Let's jump over to my personal Facebook page, and we'll see what it looked like as it posted it on Facebook. So here you can see it says, Tony Northrup uploaded a new video, and it's trying to play it back. So you see that Lytro creates a video by adding some animation to the picture automatically. You can control that animation using the desktop tool. It does not add any sort of music to it. <laughs> so I, I feel like they should give you the option to add some ambience and sound. And so what I did when working on my own was I pulled that video into Premiere Pro and added some music and extended it a little bit. So you have the ability to pull it into your own video editing app, but the default videos are low quality uh, and kind of lacking in any sort of sound. So in summary, we like the Lytro. We think it's a fun tool. We had a lot of hope for its professional potential to add pictures that really have pop and to mix the 3D animated pictures into our videos. Unfortunately, the lack of sharpness prevented us from doing that. And the long kind of painful workflow, the unreliable depth maps, and the amount of editing that need to go into it mean that it's also not that fun of a camera to actually use. But we're very excited about Lytro as a company, and we're looking forward to future versions of the software and the camera. If you like these videos, please check out our books, Stunning Digital Photography, our Lightroom 5 book, and my photography buying guide all about gear. Don't forget to share this video, subscribe, and click like. Thanks so much.